from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Our uh, special guest is J.D. Vance, and why don't I ask him to come up now. J.D.? So, thank you very much for coming. Let me give people who may not know your background a little introduction. J.D. is a native of Middletown, Ohio, okay, and a graduate of the Middletown High School. He then uh, went into the Marines for four years, served in Iraq. And came back, went to Ohio State, and finished it in two years. Then went to Yale Law School, uh, graduated there as a member of the Yale Law Journal, clerk for a federal judge for a year. He is now in the investment world, in, based in part in Washington, D.C. He is uh, married to a former classmate from Yale Law School who is here somewhere, maybe on her way, with bringing his two-month-old son. <laughs> so if you see a two-month-old son somewhere, that's his son. So let's start. Um, sure. Surely, when you started to write this book, in your wildest imagination, you could not have thought that you were going to write a New York Times bestseller in your first book, or did you? Uh, no, I certainly didn't think that I would. So was it, where did the idea for the book come from? Well, it actually started in law school, and, and really the genesis was that I was very interested in some of the, the concepts and the ideas that I wrote about in the book, and most specifically this question of upward mobility in the United States. And at Yale, we had to write this, basically this thesis by the end of our third year in order to graduate. And I really wanted to write it about sort of the legal and policy implications of social mobility in the United States or, or the lack thereof. And the more that I started to talk through the idea and the people that were advising me, um, the more that especially uh, my, my, my primary advisor, a woman named Amy Chua, who herself is, is a pretty successful author, um, she continues she's the to, author of Tiger. She's the, the author of Battle Hymn of the Tiger Mother. And she encouraged me more and more to, to bring my personal experiences to bear because she thought that I, I could write something that was both hopefully intellectually interesting but also personally and emotionally powerful. And as I, as I continued to write the book, I was honestly a little resistant to that at first. I didn't like the idea of opening up my personal life and telling all these personal stories. Uh, but the more that I wrote, the more that I realized that to the degree that I had a unique contribution, it was that I understood these things from the inside as opposed to just as an academic. All right. So um, you had the idea of writing a book. What, how long did it take you to write the book? Well, I was, I was always working on it part time. So I always had another job while I was writing the book. And I, I think that it, it probably took me about two and a half years. So I started writing it, yeah, towards the middle of 2013, and I finished towards the end of 2015. So, so you write it in here. longhand, or do you do it on a computer, or? Yeah, no, I did, I did it on my computer, yeah. My handwriting is absolutely terrible. Yeah. All right. <laughs> and so as you're writing it, um, did you have any publisher lined up, or did you just say, I'll write it, and then I'll get a publisher? Yeah, so, so this is interesting, and in some ways exemplifies something that I really write about in the book, this idea of social capital and how social connections can have these, these really important benefits. Um, so b because of Amy, when I started to really think about making this into a book project, you know, she said, okay, let me introduce you to these people that I know in the publishing world. And so one of the people she introduced me to is this, this woman who eventually became my agent and really good friend, Tina Bennett. And as I quickly learned, when you have an idea and you have somebody like Tina really advocating for it, um, the publishing, finding a publisher is, is, is relatively easy. And that's, that's sort of what happened with me, is that the hard part for me was getting into the agent publishing world. And then once I was there, it wasn't so hard to find the publisher. Sometimes first-time authors say, you know, this shouldn't be that hard to write a book. And then about halfway through, they say, how can I get out of this project? So <laughs> were you in that category? Did you ever want to abandon it? Uh, yeah, I, I definitely did want to abandon it. And if my wife is here, she can probably tell you how miserable I was about that 50% way through, through the writing process. Yeah, I mean, for, for me, what was so tough is that once I got about halfway through the book, you know, obviously it was too late to give up. I couldn't just stop writing it. Um, but, you know, writing an additional 40, 50,000 words just seemed so imposing. And I realized then what, what I didn't realize going into the project is that I probably had about a 10 to 1 ratio of, of words typed 
to words that made it into the final manuscript. And so I just didn't realize what a long slog it would be until I was about halfway through it. And, and yeah, I, I definitely thought to myself, hey, would it be possible to get out of this? So your publisher had some confidence. Uh, the initial print run was 10,000. That's right. So 10,000 isn't 500,000, but uh, 10,000 was good for a first author. Uh, at what point when the book came out, did people say, hey, there aren't enough copies out anymore and we have to go print more? Yeah, so, so this happened um, relatively quickly after the, the book came out. I, I want to say you know, two or three weeks, maybe. There was an interview I did with a magazine, The American Conservative, that went viral, as they say online. A lot of people were sharing it on Twitter and Facebook and so forth. And I, I went to go check my Amazon ranking, which you know, those of you who have written a book will know that your Amazon ranking is a way to check in real time how your book is actually selling. So there was a point in my life where I was checking it like obsessively, probably every seven or eight seconds. <laughs> and I, I go to check my, my Amazon ranking and it says, you know, like book is out of stock, will ship in about a week. And I realized then that, oh wow, we don't have enough books that are out there. And so that's when they really started to, to turn on the proverbial presses. So how many have now been printed, would you say? So I, I don't know how many total are in print. I know that hard copies we've sold just under a million. And it's, it's a little over a million if you count digital copies and audio copies and all that stuff. So the title, okay. Yeah. Now the title, um, very often authors don't come up with a title right away, and was that your idea for the title, and, or where did it come from? Yeah, it came through a conversation with my agent, this, this uh, woman, Tina. You know, I really wanted the word hillbilly to be in the, in the book title, and the reason I wanted that word to be in the title is because I, I thought it captured both this sort of particular kind of cultural subsegment that I was trying to write about, but I also thought that it captured, obviously, this, this sort of interesting insider-outsider dynamic that existed in my family where my grandma would say, you know, we're hillbillies, we're allowed to call each other hillbillies, but if anybody else calls you a hillbilly, then you have to punch them in the nose. Right. And so it, 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 it was this sort of interesting word that it always had a really textured meaning as I grew up, and so I wanted that word to be in the title. But elegy was something that it really had to take a while before I was, one, comfortable with making it hillbilly elegy. And, and I think that was Tina's idea to actually pair elegy with hillbilly. And there were a couple of reasons for that. So now, as the book has become so well-known, you are reasonably well-known. Can you go to a restaurant without people asking for autographs or selfies, or that hasn't come to be a problem yet? Uh, it, 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 it depends on where I'm at. So I, I get noticed, um, you know, so back in Columbus, I get noticed a pretty fair amount. I get noticed sometimes in D.C. I certainly get noticed a lot back in eastern Kentucky or in southwestern Ohio. Um, but, you know, if it, like I was in Nashville, I don't know, a week, week and a half ago, and I didn't get noticed once there. Okay. So, you know, it, it definitely... Well, if you there's, have a, there's, if there's, you have a record, a you, you have to make a record there, I think. Or something. Yeah, that's right. I think so. But, so... <laughs> Now, what has been the reaction of your family? Many of the family secrets that many people don't really want revealed about themselves. Everybody has family secrets. You sure. seem to reveal every family secret. What was the reaction <laughs> of your family to this? Well, I didn't reveal every family secret. I have to keep That's material a for volume. a second book. Yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting. I, I, in talking to my family about revealing some of these secrets, I think that, that, that I've noticed there's been a slight tone shift from when I started to write the book to where it is now, right? I think that people were much more open about spilling the family history on the pages of a book that no one expected anybody to read. I think, I think now, now that we're at the number of copies we've sold and, and people are talking about the book, there's maybe a little bit more sensitivity. Uh, but yeah, you know, some people definitely say, look, it's in the family. We shouldn't air the family's dirty laundry. Uh, some people, I think, appreciate that it was an important and worthwhile story to tell. Some people come down a little bit in the middle. So do any of them say, well, how come I don't get any royalties from this? <laughs> they don't say that to you yet? I haven't gotten that yet, but okay. maybe, maybe I will now, especially since this is on C-SPAN. Okay. <laughs> so let's talk about the book itself. Um, I... I've read it and uh, enjoyed it a great deal. I would say I, I think its success is due to three things, and I'd like to go through each of those three. Uh, one is I think the writing style was very crisp, very clear, um, very uh, to the point, not a lot of excess verbiage. Second, your personal story is extraordinary, which is the kind of thing that 
it's almost like a novel. It's hard to believe it was true. And then third, the impact, the, the relationship between what's going on in the country, the opio opioid crisis, problem of unemployment in certain parts in the country. So let's go through each of these first. Sure. All right. First, the writing style. Were you a gifted writer in college, in law school? Where did you get this, what I would call, very crisp, very clear writing style? Yeah, I, I think definitely law school helped a lot in that regard because one of the things they teach you in law school is, you know, don't write a lot with a lot of excess verbiage. Try to be clear and concise, direct, but also engaging. And so, you know, thinking about how to, how to write as a lawyer, cut out some of the excess words was definitely helpful. Um, but, you know, I, it, it, it's interesting you ask if I was a talented writer um, always. I mean, I, I don't necessarily think that I am a talented writer, but it, it's funny because there was this eighth grade biography uh, that I had to write. And when my, fam my family still has this eighth grade biography, and it's interesting because it's obviously very similar to what's in Hillbilly Elegy, and they'll pass it around and go, oh, J.D., it, you know, he was such a great writer even when he was 14 years old. And then when my wife picks up that same thing and reads it, she'll go, your family's not being honest with you. You are not that good of a writer when you're 14 years old. So, so I, I don't know. I, I, I do think that law school helped. I mean, there's this story that I tell in the book where the first big writing assignment I had in law school, I handed it in, I was pretty proud of it, and this, this law school professor handed it back and circled this big section and said, this is a vomit of sentences masquerading as a paragraph. So I think if you asked him if I was a talented writer, he'd probably say no. So to, now today, um, having had a first book that's very successful, normally publishers will go to the author and say, you are Ernest Hemingway, you are great, let's have another book right away, and the sooner you get it out, the better. So surely they are after you to write another book. Are you thinking <laughs> of writing one right now? Yeah, so, so definitely thinking about writing another book, and I, I think I eventually will. You know, m my view on this is that it's not something that I'm trying to undertake tomorrow. Um, so if, if I write another book, it'll be a couple of years from now as opposed to immediately. And, but eventually there'll be a paperback edition of this. That's right. And will you edit it or change it a little bit, or you just go out the same way? I think I'll probably go at it the same way. I, I, I would like to add a chapter just to contextualize some of the political salience that a lot of people have attributed to the book. Because, of course, you know, when I started writing this in 2013, I had no idea that it would be attached to the 2016 election in, in this really, you know, frankly to me, pretty bizarre way. Um, so I think I, I would like to write at least a little bit about that because I haven't talked a ton about that. But otherwise, the, the, the rest of the book will stay the same. Okay, before the book paperback comes out, or maybe after the paperback comes out, there is supposed to be a movie. Ron Howard is, I guess, producing a movie, or maybe directing it as well. Who is going to play you? <laughs> um, I, I don't know. The, the thing about this is that, you know, I want it to be somebody who's good looking, but not so good looking that people are disappointed when they actually meet me. <laughs> um, All right. Okay. But, but, but yeah, I, 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 that, that, this is the question that I have a real, real, real trouble meeting because, you know, who really fits into that, you know, not too warm, not too cold category? Right. Well, I'm sure you'll find somebody. Let's go to the second part of why I think the book is so successful, and that is your life story. So for those who may not have read the book, um, and I don't want to give away everything in it, but give away a fair bit, um, where were you born? So I was born in Middletown, Ohio, southwestern and, Ohio. Right, and your biological mother and biological father were married at the time? They were. Okay, and did they get divorced shortly thereafter? Very shortly after. I, I think I was maybe a year old when they got divorced, but b before okay. memory, certainly. So your biological mother was raising you for the early years? Correct. And then um, you had a very close relationship with your maternal grandfather and maternal uh, grandmother, uh, right? Sure. And what was their name that you called them? I called them Mamaw and Papaw. Their names were Bonnie and Jim. Okay, and is that a hillbilly type word or it was unique to your family? No, I, I think that it's, it's definitely pretty common in the broader culture. It's not exclusive, I've learned, to, you know, sort of hillbilly culture, um, but it's definitely something that people from that region of the country disproportionately, they call their grandparents Mama and Papa. Now, people who might live in the East Coast would say, well, what's hillbilly about Ohio? That's the center of the United States. Sure. But you might describe that your roots and your family's roots were really from Kentucky. Describe right. how you came to Ohio and your family came to Ohio. 
Yeah, so they were part of this really massive mi migration from places like Eastern Kentucky, East Tennessee, West Virginia, to the industrial Midwest, right? And I think when they moved, they also brought a lot of their, their cultural attributes with them. And so, again, even though my family lived in southwestern Ohio, um, you know, we traveled back to Eastern Kentucky a lot because I spent so much time with my grandparents. I, I spent a lot of my formative years in Eastern Kentucky and always felt that that was sort of our real homeland. And it's interesting, that that's a pretty common attitude. You know, folks, there are country music songs about this. There are a lot of stories really similar to mine where people who grew up in the industrial Midwest, who grew up in Michigan or Indiana or Ohio, felt like their real home was back in West Virginia because they spent so much of their lives back in those places and that's where their family was really from. Okay, so you're growing up and you have a stepsister or a full sister? Uh, yes, yeah, sister. Yeah, sister. so yeah, different dad, same mom. Okay, and so both of you are being raised by your single mother. Yep. And how did she support herself? Yeah, so um, I, you know, mom, I remember became a nurse sometime after, uh, you know, maybe I was eight or nine or so. So for a couple of years, she was a nurse, and actually, as I write about in the book, those were pretty good times economically. You know, we weren't struggling economically during that period of our lives. Uh, before then, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I think that, you know, she, she worked odd jobs. My grandparents helped out a little bit. And then, you know, certainly one of the, the stories in the book is that, you know, after mom was no longer working in nursing, you know, things were pretty tough for, for our family economically. And I think more important, they were, more importantly, they were, they were tough socially. There were a lot of issues. So your mother, as you write in your book, was married or had uh, male relationships with people who were living with her sure. like four or five or six different times. So uh, wasn't that kind of disconcerting to you to see a different man in the house all the time? Or Yeah, it was definitely an unstable childhood from the perspective of people who were, who were coming in and out of our lives. And I think that you know, I didn't realize until I was older what effect that was having on me. I didn't like it when I was a kid. I certainly didn't like that, you know, I, I'd befriend this guy or I feel like this guy was starting to become a bit of a father figure and then all of a sudden he was out of our lives. Um, I knew that was common. I knew a lot of my friends from back home were going through the same thing and that none of them liked it either. I didn't quite appreciate the effect that maybe it was having on me until, you know, until I was older and started to look back on these things. At some point, as you write in your book, you developed, you redeveloped a relationship with your biological father. Sure. You went and actually lived with him for a while, but that was not as pleasant an experience as you had thought it would be. Is that correct? Well, it was pleasant in the sense that, you know, he really had his life together. He was living with my stepmom, and they had, they had a really, I think, a happy home life. And in some ways, I was looking for that. I was searching for that family stability. I think it was in the eighth grade or so when this happened. Um, but I also realized that, that I had become incredibly attached to my grandma, right? Because even when I was living with mom as a kid, even when my sister and I were living with mom as kids, you know, we spent a ton of time with our grandparents. And as mom sort of struggled with problems, we, more, we spent more and more time with our grandparents. And so there was this real weird moment where I was living with my dad and I recognized that he had a sort of a normal home as people understood it, but I just felt so desperate to get back to my grandma's house and to live with her, and that's eventually what I did. You know, I, I don't think I realized until that moment that in my own mind and in my own heart, Mamaw had sort of become my, my chief caretaker. Okay, so you lived with your biological father for a while, it wasn't as happy as an experience as you had hoped. You then moved in with your maternal grandmother and grandfather. Right. And then it, and you were well, very- Papa was, he, he had he, passed away he at this passed point. Passed away, so now I can talk about that. He was very close to you, so sure. the shock of his passing away, how did that affect you? Well, it, it, I mean, it affected me, I think, in all the ways that the death of a parent affects a, a young kid. You know, Papal, because of the situation growing up, because of the revolving door of father figures and so forth, you know, Papal was the closest thing that I had to a dad during those formative years. You know, he was the person who took care of things. He was the person who made sure that we had all the things that kids need. And also, you know, he was just an emotional support for me and my sister and my grandmother. You know, I always had this sense that if Papa was around, things would be taken care of. You know, he was always the person who was calmest when family drama was happening. He was the person who never lost his temper, who never flew off the handle. You know, even Mama, as much as I loved her, she, she had a temper and, and Papa didn't. So I think that it affected me in, in a number of, of different and negative ways 
But the way that it affected me most of all is really what came after it. You know, I understood as a kid very instinctively that Papaw was the glue that held the family together, and I realized it in a, in a non-instinctive and very obvious way when he wasn't there, just what, you know, just what would happen. So um, you lived with your mother for a while, but at one point um, she um, um, was violent and with you and very difficult to deal with, and she had a, a drug problem, as you were, were sure. late in the book. And what was it like, you recount in the book, an experience where, in effect, the police came and saved you from your mother. Is that fair? Yeah, you know, I, I, I think about this story a lot because, you know, I, I wonder... You know, I was 12 or 13 when this happened. I, I always wonder if, if maybe it wasn't quite as dangerous as I remember. Um, I, I think in part that's just because I'm a lot closer to mom now, and I think in some ways people, you know, they, they try to remember things in a way that, that you know, reflect fondly on, on people that they love, and I certainly love my mom, and, and, and we're, we're doing pretty well in our relationship now. But, you know, yeah, at, at, you know, I, I was terrified. I mean, I, I thought that we were going to die, and I thought that Mom was going to try to kill us. And so, and this was in a car. The car was traveling very fast, and she was certainly uh, didn't seem especially stable. And so I got out of the car and ran and eventually found this woman who called the police, and the police came and arrested Mom, and she was, you know, she was charged with domestic violence. So, you know, that was obviously a pretty traumatic moment. You know, there's, there's no other way to, to cut it. After that happened, did you go then live with your grandmother or did you go back and live with your mother after that incident? Well, for a time, I lived with my grandmother. You know, it, it, again, the, I was always living with Mamma for weeks or months at a time, even when things were going really well. And so it wasn't that different of, uh, it wasn't that much of a departure from our normal routine. Um, but yeah, I w wouldn't live with Mamma for a little while and then eventually wouldn't move back in with Mom. But again, that was sort of the way that things went with us. Okay, and um, when you were growing up, uh you know, when I was growing up, I didn't have the experiences that you did, but I wouldn't have the ability to totally recall what happened when I was 12 or 10 or 9. I, how do you recall that, and did you have documents, or how did, how did you know these incidents so well? Yeah, well, I think this is where, you know, ha being able to rely on your family really helps, right? So, you know, a lot of this stuff I tried to cross-reference as much as possible with my aunt or my sister or my mom, my dad. You know, what happened here, this is sort of, you know, here's the draft, here's the manuscript of this particular story. You know, what am I leaving out? What am I missing? What haven't I, I quite remembered correctly? And I, and I do think, you know, going back to how the family reacted to the book, that's one of the reasons they reacted pretty well is because I tried to make them part of the writing process. This wasn't just sort of from my memory onto the page. I really tried to make it a, a, a family memoir in that sense. Um, you know, but but as, I, as I said in the introduction, yeah, I'm, I'm sure that, that, that things aren't perfect, but they're certainly, you know, how I, how I remember them. And I think that they're, 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 they're pretty, pretty well documented, at least okay. as much as you can, with what is primarily a memoir. Now, as you go through in the book, you point, you point out, obviously, your grandmother died as well. That must have been fairly sure. traumatic. You were, were you living with her at the time that she died? Or? No, I was in the Marine Corps at the time. So this was actually just a few months before I left for Iraq in 2005. And, you know... You were it, living with her when you were... You're getting ready. When you graduated from high school, you were living with yeah, her? Yeah, that's right. No, no, yeah. So I, I, I lived with her for almost all of high school and uh, left for the Marines from, you know, from her house. So you were uh, filling out applications, you write in your book, for, sure. for college. And then either you felt you couldn't afford the college or you weren't sure you were ready for it. What was the reason you didn't go to college right out of high school? Well, it was both. Uh, definitely, I didn't feel ready for it. I thought that you know, I, I had at least enough maturity at the time to recognize that this maybe was my one real opportunity to have, you know, any, anything in the way of, of a good job or a good career. And that if I screwed this college thing up, that would be pretty much it. That would be me blowing my one chance. And so, you know, because of that, I didn't want to take it for granted. And I thought that I was in this position just as a person where if I went to college, I, I felt like I would have, I would have taken advantage of it. You know, the cost part of it was definitely a significant issue as well. And, it, you know, it wasn't just the cost. I mean, obviously, you know, I knew that I'd have to take out all these loans, and we sort of knew that there were these, you know, Pell Grants and things like that that I'd be able to take advantage of. Uh, but we're, even with that, I knew that it would be a pretty significant amount of debt to it to incur. But it was more actually the logistical side of it that, that made college seem so imposing. You know, if, if you think about, like, filling out the financial aid paperwork, 
you know, what is, what is your dad's annual income? What is your dad's address? I mean, at that time, I hadn't spoken to my legal father in six or seven years. Going and finding that information would have required a certain amount of detective work. Uh, you know, there, there were sort of these pages to sign off on these massive loans. And it was my grandma who hadn't graduated from high school and me. And it just seemed really imposing and in some ways a little terrifying to go through this entire administrative process that no one really in my family had gone through. And, you know, I didn't feel comfortable doing it myself. Okay. So you just said, I'll walk down the street and go to the Marine recruiter. Is that what happened? Or well, yeah, that, that's, a, I think, a simple version of, of what happened. I mean, I, at that point, so there are six, six kids in my generation of grandchildren, um, my two older cousins, my sister, and my two younger cousins. And of the six of us, three of us enlisted in the Marine Corps, and both of the older cousins had. So I, um, I, I, I was encouraged pretty strongly by my cousin Rachel, who was in the Marine Corps. Um, she said, you know, if you're worried about how you're going to pay for school, and more importantly, you're worried about whether you're ready for college, you should just go to join the Marine Corps. Like, that'll be great for you. You'll, you know, you'll get, get out of town, you'll see some stuff, you'll, you'll gain some financial independence, and you should, you should really go and think about doing that. Okay, so you signed up for the Marine Corps. Did your family tell you that was a good idea? Your mother, <laughs> your... Uh, well, I, you know, it's definitely a, a patriotic community and a patriotic family, so people were proud of me, but they were not especially happy that I had chosen. Okay. You know, remember, this is, this is, I guess I signed up in 2003. We had just invaded Iraq. We had been involved in Afghanistan for a little while. There was definitely some real a apprehension, justifiably so, about what joining the Marine Corps meant, what I was getting myself into. Um, and Mamaw especially reacted very negatively. You know, I, I think in some ways she framed my decision to go to the Marine Corps instead of college you know, almost as a betrayal, that you're going off and leaving me, you're leaving me to take care of myself, you could get hurt. And, and I think that was obviously you know, very hard, but ultimately she understood why I needed to do it. All right, so you went to basic training, and what was that like? Did you have any fear you couldn't get through basic training? No, I, I was never afraid that I couldn't get through I mean, maybe when I was in high school, I was a little bit afraid of the physical demands and so forth. Um, you know, but, but a drill instructor told me, actually, you know, if you think those drill instructors are going to be mean, they'll be nothing like that grandma of yours. Right. And I, I, I really thought that, that, that so long as I could physically cut it, the psychological part would be fine and I'd be able to make it. And, 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 and that was true. You know, Marine Corps boot camp is definitely challenging. Um, but, but it's also, you know, in a weird way, it's kind of fun. Maybe it's, you know, Stock, Stockholm Syndrome, but I know a lot of Marines who actually enjoyed their Marine Corps boot camp experience, and I, I was no different in that, that Your regard. grandmother, by the way, recounting your book, she has a colorful language. Um, did that <laughs> rub off on you? How did you avoid, uh, or did she never was embarrassed to use that, those words around you, or you didn't <laughs> say anything about it? Yeah, well, my, I think my son is too young to show evidence of how foul my, my language is. Um, you know, I, I definitely try to cut back on the language relative to my grandma just because, I mean, she really, she loved a dramatic and well-placed F word. <laughs> and I, I, you know, you go from Mamaw's house to the U.S. Marine Corps, you know, the, the phrase curse like a sailor doesn't come from nowhere. Right. And the Marine Corps is part of the Department of the Navy. And I, I think that I definitely have had to scale back my language just to like operate in civil right. society. But, uh, but, but it's, it's like ingrained in me and, and I definitely don't right. always succeed. Right. So you're in the Marine Corps, you get through basic training and then you go over to Iraq? Yeah. And right. were you afraid you would come back uh, in one piece or you weren't sure you would survive? Or? I think anybody when they're about to deploy to Iraq is, is worried about whether they'll, they'll come back in one piece. And the thing to remember is that I had an MOS, meaning a military occupation specialty, where you know we had lost some people in my MOS to to combat deaths and combat injuries, uh, but it wasn't quite you know I wasn't thinking quite as much about the danger as maybe I would would have been if I was you know working in the infantry, for example. So I was worried about it, but I also tried to tried to talk myself up and recognize that. You know, it'll be dangerous. It'll certainly be more dangerous than driving down the street, but I'll probably end up, you know, most Marines okay. end up coming back okay. All right, so after four years, you um, leave the military, right? Yeah. And then you decide, do you want to go to college? Sure. You felt you were then ready for it? Yep. But you were then four years older than many of your college contemporaries, right? Sure. So why do you decide to go to Ohio State? Not that it's not a great place to go, but did you ha consider any other place? Yeah. I 
some OSU fans out there, go Bucks. Um, well, you know, I, I think it's possible to sort of make these decisions seem more rational than they, they were. I mean, honestly, the reason I wanted to go to Ohio State is because I grew up rooting and loving Ohio State, and a lot of my friends had gone there. Okay. Right? I, was, I was not nearly as maybe thoughtful about my college decision as I should have been. Um, I had a great experience there, and I'm really glad that I went there, but it was basically luck that I found myself at Ohio okay. State. I wasn't sort of thinking as, as smartly about it as I should have been. Okay, so normally people go to college for four years. Yeah. And you seem to get through Ohio State in two years. How do sure. you get through Ohio State in two years? Well, um, you take a lot of classes, you go during the summer, and you transfer credits that you gain during the Marine Corps over to Ohio okay. State. Those three things were able to allow, were, were enough to enable me to cut a couple years off. Okay, so did, how did you support yourself? Where would the money come from for Ohio State? Did you have grants then, or did Marine Corps salary was enough to supplement you? No, so it's a combination of things. So I was no longer in the Marine Corps, so I wasn't getting a salary from the you government saved anymore. That. Sure. Um, so you know, a little bit of savings, um, a little bit of, uh, of of debt that I incurred. You know, I borrowed some, you know, some of those subsidized loans. Uh, had some Pell grants at OSU. Had um, had the GI Bill, which I was trying to save for law school, but I used some of the GI okay. Bill during during college. And then I, you know, I worked jobs during uh, during college, so sort of those multiple different sources of income were enough to get me through. Okay, so you graduate in two years, yep. and then you decide you want to go to law school. Yeah. But as you point out in your book, there aren't as many people going to, let's say, Yale or Harvard law sure. schools from Ohio State, um, though there obviously are some. But uh, how did you happen to decide to go to Yale Law School, which is a great law school, as opposed to Ohio State Law School or or some other school in the Midwest? Yeah, so, so this is another thing where I wasn't thinking super strategically about it. Um, you know, I, I applied to a few law schools, I got into them, um, and, and sort of was thinking about just, you know, going to, to one of those schools. And my friend, uh, you know, one of my best friends, he was, he was the best man at my wedding, actually, who himself was a lawyer, you know, said, look, if, if you, you know, if you, you've got good grades and you think you can get into a good place, this is 2009, this is right after the Great Recession, he's like, I've got friends from law school who, who are struggling to find work, so you should try to get into the best school you can because that'll be your best insurance policy against unemployment. And so then I actually ended up taking off a little bit of time and then reapplying, and that's when I applied to, to Yale. But you were an, um, an average high school student, but in college you did much better. How did you change from a mediocre average student to a great student? Yeah, I think average is probably putting it charitably in high school. Um, you know, a couple of things, right? I mean, so, so one, I, I was just a more mature person. This goes back to me being ready for college in a psychological way. I sort of appreciated that it was this opportunity as opposed to just a responsibility that somebody had foisted upon me. And so I just tried harder. I think, you know, paying for it and sort of seeing that debt bill go up and up and up maybe gave me some sense of the right. fact that it was, I, I, I was lucky to be able to go there. Um, you know, but, but I also thought a lot about my grandma when I was in college. You know, this is a woman who, who left school, I think, when she was 14 years old to come north to Ohio. She had not had many educational opportunities. She was super, super smart. And I, I just thought to myself that, you know, if Mamma could sacrifice all those things to get me to a place like this, I should t actually take advantage of it and I should actually try hard. Okay, so you go to Yale Law School. Now, Yale Law School is uh, about the hardest law school to get into the United States, very small law school. Um, many people go there from Harvard, Yale, Princeton, similar kind of colleges. Did you feel a little out of place when you got to Yale Law School? There weren't that many people in your class, as I recall, from Ohio State. Yeah, I, I think in my year, I was the only Ohio State grad at Yale. Um, you know, it was, it was weird to me because I realized that there were high schools, you know, preparatory schools, where there were more students from that high school at Yale Law School than there were my university, which just struck me as a, a little bit weird. Um, but, but yeah, it was definitely a culture shock. It was, it was more of a culture shock, frankly, than any place I had ever been. It was more of a culture shock than the Marine Corps, more than Ohio State. You know, it, 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 it was sort of astonishing just how different the expectations and the backgrounds were right. from some of my classmates relative to where I came from. Now, uh, another f person who went to Yale Law School, Bill Clinton, came from Arkansas, and he used to apparently take a lot of pride and say, I'm from Arkansas, it's a great state, and so forth. Did you say, I'm a hillbilly from Kentucky and Ohio, and 
and you know, I'm really different, but I'm really as good as you guys, or how did you fit in? I don't know that I ever introduced myself and said, I'm a hillbilly from Ohio, how are you? <laughs> Um, but I think that definitely came through in the way that I conducted myself. I mean, I, I was definitely a pretty strong Ohio partisan, even in undergrad. I think everyone, or, or even in law school, I think everyone knew where I was from. Right. Um, but, but yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know if I use that precise phrase. Okay, so how did you do it? How did you do it, Yale Law School? Were you academically at the top or in the middle or the bottom, or where were you? I did okay. I, you know, I don't think I was at the top by any means. I think my wife was at the top, which is why she's clerking for the Chief Justice. Um, I, I definitely didn't do as well as her, I know that. The weird thing about Yale, for, for those of you who sort of know some of these law schools, is they, they don't give traditional grades. So it's actually really hard to sort of know where you rank relative to your peers. My sense is that I was doing fine. I wasn't at the bottom of the pack, but I certainly wasn't at the top either. And I was sort of, I was comfortable with that. Okay, so you wrote your way onto the Yale Law Journal, which is usually one of the most prestigious things you can do at Yale Law School. And then did you decide you wanted to practice law or be a clerk, or what did you decide you wanted to do? Yeah, so, so my wife and I had this opportunity to go actually to the Eastern District of Kentucky. You met um, your wife, and she in the same yeah, class as yeah, you? Yeah, she's in the same Is she same here now? Is, where is she? <laughs> she probably your wife is. here somewhere? I don't see her here, but I thought she was coming. <laughs> where is she? Oh, there, there she, she is. is. There's okay, <laughs> there she is. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. So, so, sorry, Ush. <laughs> All right, so you met her and you were in the same class? Yeah, so we were in the same class and we had an opportunity to clerk on the Eastern District of Kentucky, uh, which both of our judges, we worked for separate judges, but they were both in Covington, which is just over the river from Cincinnati. And so it was sort of this perfect opportunity to go and, and you know, clerk for a federal judge, but be close to home and work on things that were, were both really interesting to us. You had spent most of your life trying to escape Kentucky and then you went <laughs> back to Kentucky. Well, I, I don't know that I was trying to escape Kentucky so much as the chaotic home that I, I okay. grew up in. I, I've always sort of loved, you know, loved the places okay. that I came from and always wanted to go back. But yeah, you know, it, it, it definitely was a really exciting and a, and a really good okay. year. We both worked for like really good people. You know, sometimes people get stuck with, with bad judges, but we both worked for great people and had, had a great year. Okay, so as I said at the beginning, uh, there are three reasons why I think the book is very successful, at least in my view. One is it's very well written, very precise, and, and very uh, uh, good read. Secondly, um, the life story is almost like a novel, so it's very interesting. But the third is I think one of the reasons the book has become so popular, because as you point out yourself, um, the world has changed a fair bit since you conceived of writing the book, and now sure. what you wrote about is seen as one of the problems of our country, which we have a lot of um, drug abuse, opioid abuse, unemployment, particularly at say in the Midwest, and a lot of the kind of people that you come from, that roots where you come from, have these problems. So let's talk about that for a while. Sure. Um, let's talk about the opioid problem, for example. When you growing up, um, you point out in your book that drug abuse was a problem in your area, and you think it's gotten worse, and why do you think it's so bad? Well, yeah, it was definitely something I saw growing up, and I remember when you know, addiction hit our family, and I found out that mom was, was addicted to, you know, prescription pain pills, as we called them back then. I just didn't understand it, right? I didn't understand why anybody would be addicted to pain pills. It wasn't especially common. This is back in the mid-90s. So it, the problem had not gone mainstream as it has now. Now, of course, you know, in 2017, we sit here and we talk about the opioid epidemic, which is now really a nationwide crisis. And so I, I did feel in some ways like I got an early insight into what would later become a significant crisis. Why has it gotten worse? There are a ton of different reasons and a ton of different explanations, right? So you know, one is, I, I think, you know, to be honest, a lot of these drugs were marketed as non-addictive and they were addictive. And so people got hooked on them and it caused a lot of problems. Um, I think that you have a, a really significant overprescription problem in some of these areas where you know, I, I was just in southeastern Ohio a few months ago talking to some folks who are dealing with this, and they tell me that, you know, when high school kids used to hang out and get into their parents' liquor cabinet or get into their parents' beer, now they will get into grandma's medicine cabinet and pass around drugs. Well, that, that's a different kind of problem. Um, and I also think that, you know, it, it is in some ways a consequence of some really negative social problems that exist in these communities. You know, if you have domestic violence, if you have a lot of family instability, if you have a lot of unemployment, then people do eventually get, get they find some way to deal with it. Maybe 50 years ago, they dealt with it with alcohol, and now they're dealing with it through a substance that's just so much did, more addictive. But you largely seem to have avoided, you know, 
the opioid problem. And you write, write as I recall, maybe some use of marijuana or something, but not sure. really anything that was addictive. So how did you avoid that in the environment in which you grew up? Well, I think Mammal was very cognizant of the problems of addiction and was really, really strict about this stuff. I mean, if she found out that we were smoking a cigarette or that we'd, we'd had anything to drink, Mammal would fly off the handle. And I think, I think she, she appreciated just how bad addiction could be and that it clearly had this role in our family. You know, this, this is the thing that really ruined her life for the first 30 years of her marriage was alcoholism and then it was ruining the life of one of her kids. And so I was very much on guard. I mean, almost obsessively so, right? I'm one of these people who doesn't like to take ibuprofen for a headache because I'm like really uncomfortable with the idea of putting foreign substances in my body because I've seen addiction trap a lot of people. Um, you know, I, I got really sick when I was at Ohio State. I had mono and they gave me this, this synthetic opioid called Dilaudid because I had, to, I had to, you know, take some medicine. Anyway, I had this Dilaudid. I was in the hospital at Ohio State and I, I remember calling basically everyone in my family saying, I know why Mamaw didn't like us to take this stuff because it is fantastic. <laughs> So I, 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 just, I just think being on guard about that stuff what about is, alcohol? is you, good. You avoided alcohol? No, no, I haven't avoided alcohol. Um, I, <laughs> I, I certainly have never felt that I've been addicted uh, right. to alcohol. You know, I'm sort of, when they ask you at the doctor, I'm one of these, you know, one, once or twice a week type people. Um, but, but no, I've, I, I've never felt especially addicted to anything except for chocolate chip cookies and ice cream. Okay, now let's talk about unemployment. As you point out in the book, Many people left Kentucky and places like that to go north, look sure. for jobs, but those jobs have now been hollowed out. So you see a lot of unemployment in the kind of uh, background right. that you have. Can you describe whether it's getting better or worse from what's being done about it or can be done about it? Is it getting, it's certainly getting better in the past couple of years just because the economy's picked up a little bit. Um, but I, I, don't think that you, I, I don't think that it's improved significantly over you know, where it was 30 or 40 years ago. And what, what I mean is that the number of people that the coal industry or the steel mill industry employed in, let's say, the 1950s and 60s, that hasn't returned in the past couple of years. It's not you know, maybe as bad as it was, but I do think that you're seeing a really long-term significant economic shift in some of these areas. And you know, it's, it's something, honestly, I think policymakers were a little blind to. I think that everybody just thought that the economy would adjust, that put folks would get different jobs, that they would skill up and move into different professions. Uh, but what's actually happened is that you've seen a lot of communities get really significantly decimated, and that's obviously one of the undercurrents of the book. You know, w what is there to do about it? Um, there are, I, I think, a lot of different things that we could do about it. Um, you know, the, the first is that I think we have a pretty significant problem with the fact that you're effectively gr given a choice when you graduate from high school between going and, and working in a fast food job or going and getting a four-year college education. And I think that we should provide more pathways than that. I, I think it's not surprising when those are the only two pathways that you see people going in those two directions. Um, um, but, but, but I also think but I also think we have to think a little bit more constructively about regional economic development. You know, the way that this has gone for the past 10 or 20 years is that I'm a local municipality. I offer somebody a tax credit to set up a restaurant in my hometown. Uh, that's, that's great. New restaurants are fantastic, but that's not the sort of long-term economic redevelopment that has to happen in some of these areas. And I think that it's something that, you know, basically all levels of policymakers have to be thinking differently right. than they are right now. Now, uh, if somebody writes a book that's as successful as yours and, and about the subjects that you deal with, um, at some point, somebody from the Democratic National Committee or the Republican National Committee or some political entity will say, you are a great candidate to be a member of Congress, governor, senator, and maybe something even higher. So have you ever thought about and have you been importuned to run for something? I think we're out of ta ta time, right? Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> All right. So, um, so, it's, so you would say yeah. you, wouldn't, you wouldn't preclude anything from happening? No, yeah, certainly not. Um, you know, yeah, certainly when, when you, that progression is exactly right, when you have a book that's successful, uh, people from various political parties uh, come to you and ask you if you'd be interested in these things. Have and you talked to any people who have these jobs who actually like these jobs, though? Uh, I, I actually don't think that I have. Right. Um, you know, I, I've, I've talked to a couple of members of Congress 
um, not you know not about me running, but just certainly about you know in this environment, do you actually enjoy what you do? And they say, yeah, you know, I really like working on policy. The problem is we don't do any of that. <laughs> so, so no. So, but, but all right, leaving aside whether you would run for something, because the platform you now have is so great, you can be a spokesman about alcoholism, unemployment, opioid addiction, and are you going to kind of make a part of your career talking about these issues, or do you want to not be seen as a spokesman for the, these issues? Yeah, I don't know that I want to be seen as a spokesman for these issues, but I, I certainly think that it's, you know, now that I have this platform, it's, you know, I might as well do something with it productive other than just, you know, go and talk about the book. There, there are other issues um, that, are, that are worth talking about. So, you know, I've tried to be a constructive participant in some of these policy debates, you know, during the health care reform debate of a few months ago, I went on to Capitol Hill and I tried to talk to folks about, you know, this is how this might affect the opioid crisis, this is how this might affect some of the people from back home. So I, I try to be a constructive participant as much as possible, um, but, you know, we, we live in an especially non-constructive time, so I, I think that you have to be careful and you have to be smart and you have to, you, right. you know, you have to recognize that sometimes even when you try to be careful and smart, you're not actually being careful and smart. So, so when you go to talk to members of Congress or get involved with congressional staff people, do they just want a picture with you or your autograph on their book or do they actually listen to what you say? Well, it depends. It depends on the, it depends on the member and it depends on, on some of the, the staff members. Um, but no, I, I found, generally speaking, you know, I've become maybe more cynical about our political process writ large since the book came out, just, you know, from talking to folks and spending some time in these areas. Uh, I do feel more optimistic about individual members and their staff. I think that by and large, people actually want to make a difference and care about the policy and care about what, what effect it's going to have. It's just we happen to live in a political period and a political time where it's really hard to translate interest in policy to constructive accomplishments. So people who might be called, not pejoratively, but people who might call themselves hillbillies or from sure. a hillbilly culture, are they proud of your book for having exposed some of the challenges they have or are they upset for having exposed some of the challenges they have? I think opinions differ, right? I mean, you, you, there are people out there who think that I'm, I'm basically a traitor and who hate my guts. Uh, there are people out there who think that I've shed a light on really important issues and they appreciate it. I think that the, the thing that I hear most from people back home when I, you know, when I go and talk about the book or just when I hear you know, people when they run into me on the street is that they appreciate that the book has, has talked about these problems in a way that they feel like wasn't talked about before, that nobody really wrote the story from the inside, nobody really talked about you know, what is it like to grow up in a household with a lot of instability, a lot of addiction, what's it like to grow up in a household where uh, you, you know, you're really worried about whether you can pay for college or even pay for more fundamental things. You know, that, that is the part that's been the most gratifying to me. Uh, but I also think that you know, it's a region that's really large and really diverse, and so you have opinions that are probably as diverse as any large population. So what is the most frequent question you get asked? You, you, you are in the speaking circuit a little bit, and you're on TV at CNN. You're a contributor to CNN. Sure. Uh, what is the question you get most frequently asked by audiences about your book or about your background? The question that I get most frequently asked, I mean, it, it's probably how my family reacted to the book. I think that's definitely something that people are curious about. Um, I get asked a lot how my mom's doing. Well, how is she doing? And, and, and the answer to that, she's doing really well. Yeah, so she's, she's living, really well. she's not married now, she's living yeah, in she, Ohio? Yeah, yeah she, she's living back home, she's doing well, she's been clean for a very long time. And I think in some ways, you know, while, while mom may not be ready to, to play this role, and so I'm not, I'm not gonna foist it upon her, I think she's a really good example of what can happen when even after five or six times you get knocked off the horse of addiction and, and back into relapse, um, that, that it's still possible to sort of climb back out, to find the right supports, and to, and to make another go at it. And that, you know, that, that's something I really admire about mom. She's incredibly tenacious. So does she um, now have like a, 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 a the business card that says J.D. Vance's uh, mother? She doesn't have that on her <laughs> no, business card? She, she does not. <laughs> and what about your, your, your biological father? Is yeah. He, is he, do you have contact with him? And yeah, yeah, I actually just see a, you know, got a text message from him right before I, I went up here. Yeah, so, so dad and I are still, still close and, and still talk quite a bit. Um, you know, he, he's doing pretty well. Um, he, he 
you know, he's, 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 he's a great guy. And I think that he, you know, he and I most, most often talk about his grandson, and that's what he's most interested in. And I think that's true of a lot of grand, grandparents. So you uh, talk about in the book, you grew up largely with this, your sister. Yeah. Now, what is she doing now? So my sister has three kids back, back home in, uh, in Middletown, uh, has been married for 20 years or so, and, and, and is doing well. You know, I think that, that what Lindsay and I wanted to really accomplish, like what we thought of as success in our lives, was being able to give our kids the stability and the comfort and the sense of security that we didn't have as, as kids. You know, she has successfully done that for almost 20 years. Uh, her oldest kid is 18. I have done that for three months, so I'm 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 hopeful I get there too. And uh, today, um, do you find that your friends from high school they, they they laugh at your jokes more than they did before, or they treat you differently, or how do the people you grew up with treat you now that that, that you're so famous <laughs> and wealthy? Uh, uh, people ask you for money. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, sometimes people ask me for money, but that's you know not a, not a common occurrence, but. Um, yeah, you know, th there are definitely some people who laugh, uh, laugh louder at my jokes, but my real friends do not laugh louder. I, mean, I think that's one of, the, one of the really good things about having a successful book, uh, or what a successful book can do, is you definitely realize the people who are loyal to you no matter what and don't let you get too big for your britches, as we say back home. Uh, those are the people that I really latch on to. Okay, so leaving aside your potential political career, right now uh, you're not practicing law, that you are in what I would call the highest calling of mankind, uh, <laughs> private equity and investing. Um, so uh, why did you choose to go into the, what I'll call the venture capital space? Uh, you're in an area, a narrow niche of private equity, venture capital. Why did you choose to go into that area? And you're doing it from a firm that's based here and you're also living in Ohio, as both, sure. is that right? Sure, well, it, so that, that is right. And what, what I find so interesting about what I'm doing right now is that if it's done well, it can actually help create amazing new products and amazing new companies and amazing new jobs that didn't exist before, right? And so one of the things I realized in law school, and I think I came into this with sort of this veil behind my eyes that was lifted, is that you know what the, the people who I think really, frankly, call the shots in our economic system are those who are figuring out you know, where capital goes. And I think that when I realized that, I thought to myself, I'd like to be a guy who is trying to figure out how to get capital to go into good places where it's gonna do a lot of good and where it's gonna create a lot of value, not just for investors, but for people on the receiving end too. Now, some people who write first books, some people who write a book, uh, you know, Margaret Mitchell, Ralph Ellison, their first book is so successful that they have a hard time writing a second book. They get writer's block because they think nothing can be as good as the first book. Uh, you, you don't worry about that problem. Uh, well, I don't know. I, I, I think that, I, I don't necessarily know that my first book was that good, so I don't know that any follow-up will be uh, measured well or, or poorly compared to it. It certainly was very successful, and I think that it, I'd be an idiot if I expected any other book to be as successful, but I'll let other people decide whether it's good or not. So what you want to do with your life and what you'd like to, you'd be, a, let's say, a role model for people who came out of the kind of background that you came out of. And now, rightly or wrongly, whether you want it or not, you're a bit of a role model for people who come out of your kind of background. As a role model, uh, do you feel more responsibility to live a life a certain way? Do you feel you should give back to your community a certain way? What, how does your life change as a result of this book? Well, um, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely feel a certain responsibility when I go on TV not to make my entire community seem like an idiot, right? Because I, I think one of the things that I have not appreciated, but I just have accepted as reality, is that a lot of people see me as sort of a spokesperson for the white working class. Um, a lot of times I'm asked to go on TV to say, you know, what does the Trump voter feel about this or that issue? I think that's unfair. Uh, I don't think that any person could possibly speak for that many people or for the Trump voter writ large. Uh, but what I, what I try to do is recognize that some people see me as that representative. And so I, I, I try not to sound like a total buffoon when I go on TV. That's one way that I, I think things have really changed. But I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's crazy, right? I mean, a, a year and a half ago, I was not sitting here in an auditorium in front of hundreds of people. So it's, it's, it's kind of impossible to describe how my life has changed. It's, it's changed in the way that uh, you know, any person's life changes when they go from you know, sitting at home 
eating pints of ice cream and watching Netflix to sitting here in right. front of hundreds of people. But, like the people at the President of the United States called you and said, I read your book and you really typify the kind of voter I appeal to, or you haven't heard that kind of reaction yet? Uh, I've never heard that from, uh, from, from President Trump. Um, I have heard you know, people who work at the White House who said something uh, similar to that. So, uh, but no, I've, I've never gotten the phone call from President Trump, still, still waiting. So uh, today, you would say you're a very happy person. You've got a, a child, a, a wife, your mother and father are doing well. So you're a very happy person today. And, and the experience of the book has made your life even better? Yeah, yeah. I mean, th things are really going great. The book has changed my life in a very weird way, but, but in, a, in definitely a positive way. Well, look, I, I read the book, as I said. I thought it was a great book. I highly recommend it to those who haven't read it yet. And those who've read it once, read it again. Uh, I do think it's very instructive, well-written, and I want to thank you for a very interesting conversation. Thanks, David. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.